So welcome everyone to the Radiant Torah of Rebbe Nachman. And we cover the Torah portion each week with insights and inspiration from Rebbe Nachman of Breslov and our sages and Sadikim. And we want to thank Dr. Eleanor Gudis for sponsoring the Shiorim. It has been about a year, it might be even a couple of weeks over a year that she has done this. And um, there's always more and more to learn. And we thank her so much and may it be a source of merit and blessing for her and her family. Okay, so we are covering today, God willing, Parshas Amor. And I'm going to give you a little overview of the Parsha because we're not going to be covering all of the Parsha, just a few points, but I want you to have an overview of this Parsha. It's a, it's a fascinating Parsha. So the Parsha discusses the particular laws applying to Kahana, especially the laws of relationships and the de laws of defilement within relationships pertinent to the Kohanim. It discusses a particular laws about who may serve in the Mishkan, in, in the sanctuary, and what types of blemishes would make a Kohen, a priest, not allowed to serve. And also it discusses what animals are not permitted to be made as an offering, what blemishes would disqualify them. So it gives us a hint that the Kohanim are like a holy offering, okay? And um, then it gives us a, um, some laws of animal offerings. And then it gives us a brief two verses on the kindness of animals, which we'll be touching, kindness to animals, which we'll be touching on today. And then it goes over the main important holy days, starting with Shabbat, as always. And today, God willing, we'll have time to talk about Shabbat, the Sefir, Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, and uh, Shavu, Shavuot. Okay, so that's hopefully what we'll get to today. Um, so in the middle of the first verses of the Parsha that speak about the laws pertaining to the relationships of the Kohanim, and the laws of defilement and so on. It says right in the middle, um, I'm gonna, I have actually have the parsha on my screen to read from, uh, Kedoshim yiyu lelokehem. Okay, so holy shall you be to Hashem. Okay, or they shall be holy actually to their Hashem, their Lord, their God. So, and the Netzif says something very interesting. He says that this context, this idea that the Kohana are holy to God is reminding the priests that all their greatness derives from Hashem and exists in the specific context of their service of Hashem and their willingness to abide by these more structured and strictured relationships. So why is it there? So the Netziv hints to us that the Kohanim, because of their greatness, and they are great, okay? They are, they are the priests. We, we are the priests and the Kohanim are like the high priests and the Kohen HaGadol is like the highest of the highest priests. So the Kohanim certainly have a, a, um, a, a, a imperative to not only be set aside, but to set aside themselves. And because of that, that can lead to arrogance. And so the Netziv says, this is reminding us, this to God is reminding us and reminding the Kohanim to not let their greatness go to their heads and to remember what is their greatness. It's a function of their particular service of Hashem. Now, we have to honor the Kohan. How does this take place? So I'm going to give you some of the laws because uh, Cohen is elevated above his brothers, okay? And therefore, we are required to give them honor even today. So for example, 
A Cohen is served first at a banquet or public meal. A Cohen goes to the front of the line when it comes to washing hands before uh, bread at a meal. Okay, so if you ever are in a simcha, the men are on one side and you can peek over, you'll see the Kohanim. They're escorted to go first to wash their hands for the meal. Um, a Kohen leads Zimun, or he's always invited to lead Zimun. What is that? That is when there are three or more adult males at a table. The Kohen has the option to lead Birkat Hamazon, okay, the grace after meals. Okay, and um, he can refuse the honor if he wishes. Not, not everybody always wants to do that. And a Kohen is called up to the Torah first. I'm sure you all know that. It's Kohen, Levi, and Yisrael, and Shul. That's the order. The Kohen gets the first aliyah. If there's no Kohen, the Yisrael would be called in his stead. If there's neither of them, then the Yisrael will go up. Okay. So the Kohanim are accorded that honor, and they are also, they are also in general treated with a measure of respect. Truly, we should all treat each other with a measure of respect, but the Kohanim are, are with an even finer point on it, a measure of respect. So why today? Okay, yes, okay, they're Hashem's priest. Yes, it's hereditary. Yes, they can give us the priestly blessing on, on Yom Tov. They can give us this priestly blessing, but why, why today are they allowed, are, are they given this additional honor? Do we treat them with additional deference? So additionally, at any point in time, Mashiach could be revealed and the Beit HaMikdash, depending on your your uh, community's beliefs. Some people believe that it's, we're all going to build it together. Some people believe that it's going to descend from the heavens in a flash, uh, but it will always involve the, uh, the participation and direction of the Mashiach, who is not a Kohen, by, way, by the way, he will not be a Kohen. So, you know, they are ready to jump back into the service of the Beit HaMikdash. Now, we all have the obligation to learn the basic laws of the Beit HaMikdash, of service in the Beit HaMikdash. As women, we have that obligation too, okay? We should know what's going on. We should know what people are doing. We don't have the obligation with the same pressures the men have, but it's still relevant to us. And, and the Kohanim also have that obligation, it, even more so, as a matter of fact, they are held to such a standard of responsibility for these laws and such a standard for the responsibility of the anticipation of the Mashiach that a Kohen really is not allowed to get drunk. And some Kohanim don't drink at all, except maybe for Kiddush. Um, they'll have a little wine and some are, you know, restrictive. They maybe won't have more than two glasses depending on you know, their particular um, uh, uh, choice and dedication and so on. But a Cohen can never get drunk because, why? Because he might be called on any instant, in any moment to serve in the Beit HaMikdash, to get ready for the first service of the Beit HaMikdash. So it's uh, really, it's really an additional pressure and additional honor. And like all Jewish honors, it's not an honor in the sense of you go, you get an award and you thank the academy. It's not like that at all. The honor is a responsibility first and foremost. Um, there are additional laws, which um, we're not going to discuss today pertaining to the Kahana. Okay. Now, in the, in the, you heard the overview before, so in the middle, I mentioned the law of the kindness to animals, this general concept, which is in this Parsha expressed as when an ox or a goat or a sheep is born. It's actually an ox, a sheep or a goat. That's actually the order. It shall remain under its mother for seven days. Okay. And... The eight, from the eighth day onwards, 
it can be accepted as a korban, as an offering, as a sacrifice to Hashem. That's number one. And number two, the next part, which is in verse 22 also, it's right after that one, is an ox or sheep, you shall not kill it, slaughter it, and its offspring in one day. So there's a lot of discussions about this, and there's a lot of Kabbalah about it and so on. But the simple meaning is very powerful. It's that a, a newborn, okay, is precious, and that a mother has a great suffering to have her newborn pulled away from her to be weaned or slaughtered or anything. And this speaks about a sensitivity to this suffering. Okay. Now, we see what is going on in the world today. Um, it feels like it feels like the, that Mashiach can't tarry a moment longer. But with these discussions about the sanctity of life, and we really see, and, and by the way, an animal is an animal, it's not a human being, but it is representative to us about the aversion the Torah has and the Jew has to inflict suffering, even on an animal, let alone a human being. So we have to understand that this sanctity of life is something permeating the Torah. And even in the case of an animal, unless that animal is pursuing a human being to harm it, or unless that animal is being offered up to Hashem, or unless that animal is being shechted in a kosher manner, which will release its soul, okay, it's nefesh, and we make a blessing on it, we eat it in order to serve Hashem. These are the very limited contexts for killing animals, very limited. And they're all connected with Kodesh, with holiness. They are not just, you can't just kill an animal, okay? And as you all know, we don't hunt, okay? We, we don't hunt animals. We can't eat an animal. It's in other um, parshas we've talked about before that has been uh, uh, torn limb from limb and can't eat an animal alive. God forbid there are, there are cultures that even do this today that shall remain nameless um, and so on. And, and we take this very seriously because not only is there a spiritual imperative, but there's an, an emotional, psychological imperative to breeding kindness. Even when the animals even when the mother in discussion is an animal and the child in discussion is an animal. And when we get to the habit of viewing all life in has some preciousness because Hashem created it, this is a good basis for developing our character. Now, obviously this does begin with human beings, but it needs to go along. Now, I am I'm reminded of a story uh, told by, I believe, and if anybody here is more familiarity with Chabad, told by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, okay, the one before the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, who said that when he was a little boy, okay, you can correct me if it's a different Lubavitcher, Rabbi, when he was a little boy, he was walking along and he tore a leaf off a tree and his father said, don't tear a leaf off a tree because you're hurting the tree. You're destroying something for no reason. And that is how we view all of creation. No wanton destruction, no causing waste or harm for no reason. We talk about defense and defending ourselves in other chapters, that's different. So we really appreciate, we really have an appreciation of life that is unmatched in the world. When people are in Torah, they develop an appreciation of life, uh, in, for life in and of itself. Because if Hashem has created a life, there's a reason for it. We don't know the reason, but there's a reason for it. Okay. Now, we are going to move to the next part, which I mentioned in the overview. 
And that is the Mikrai Kodesh, the holy days, the holy events, the festivals, the holidays. And in this Parsha, it begins listing the holidays with Shabbat, with Shabbos. Why does it start with Shabbos? So it says that on six days work may be performed, but on the seventh day it is a complete rest, a holy occasion. You shouldn't perform any work. It's a Shabbos in all your dwelling places and so on. Why does it start before the other holidays, even before Yom Kippur, with Shabbos, with Shabbat? So Shabbos, Shabbat, is actually proclaimed, that's what mikra means, actually it's a proclamation, is proclaimed by Hashem as a holy day from creation. And the way we arrive at counting Shabbat is very different than the way we arrive at counting the Yom Tovim, the holidays. We always know that the seventh day is Shabbat. But we don't necessarily know that the 33rd day is such and such a holiday and so on. Let me explain how this works because it's really important to appreciate how much Hashem loves us and how much responsibility he gives to us. So as I mentioned, Hashem's the one who decided from creation, from before creation, what Shabbos was. But the festivals are not the same day or exactly the same time of year, exactly the same solar month at, at every time of the year. Because the base din, the, the big din, the, the court would decide the Rosh Chodesh, the new month. And the new month, when, when the new month was decided, this would determine the date of the festival because everything would proceed from the new month. We discussed the new month in previous classes. We, can, we won't go there today because it's complicated. But today, okay, today, of course, the calendar is set for the reason because we're in exile. Okay, but still, still, even though it's set, we can see a wide variance in the times of the festivals. For example, we have a leap year, okay? And that, just like in this year is a leap year, it moves the festival later because we have an additional month of Adar. But Shabbat is always the same. It's always the same, week after week after week after week. So in other words, we, or the Beit Din, our Tzadikim, are the ones that determine the dates of the festival. Again, today we have a set calendar, so we, we take this slightly, and we're slightly stepping back from this, but still, okay? Shabbat is from Hashem. How a festival gets started is we make it the festival. We agree that this is the festival in the Torah, and we follow that date, that time, that, that instruction, based on the beginning of the month. So Hashem gives us a tremendous amount of responsibility, but also power to partner with him in the shaping of time. And we know this is a window actually into the eternal, because we know that time is a construct. It's something that Hashem has created. It's a creation. He's created it for us. What is time? It's our perception of the way things are happening. For us, there's a past, there's a present, there's a future, God willing, right? For Hashem, everything's all at once, okay? Now we have convenient language to speak about what Hashem sees in the past and what Hashem sees in the present, the future. So what is the reason for this? So why do we need this? So on, on the simple level, our, our intellect couldn't handle the flood of everything all at once. We have to maintain human autonomy in order to serve Hashem. This is how Hashem created us. But aside from that, this is a function. Time is a function of the most radical change known to humankind. What's that change? That change is teshuva. Okay. And all 
the holidays are an opportunity to find a different light into which to, to find a different light from which will shine onto us a new form of teshuva, a new way of returning to Hashem. Rabbi Nachman says that our perception of Hashem changes as we change. Therefore, by implication, our perception of teshuva, of what it means to come closer to Hashem, changes as we change and as we grow. So time is a necessary function. It's not, you know, we can go into the deep esoteric nature of it, but it's not really necessary. Time is a gift to us. It's really a gift to us. And if we really pay attention to what Rabbi Nachman says about time, it's, it's uh, the richest gift in the world because he says what? You can always start over. You can always start again. Every moment is a new possibility. Every Yom Tov is a new possibility. Every weekday is a new possibility. Shabbat, every Shabbat is a new possibility. When you wake up one day to the next, Rebbe Nachman says, no day is like the previous day. There's a new energy. There's a new light. There's a new possibility that comes down from us, for us. And that is what we can choose to grow in. Or we can shut our back on it and remain the same. One of the, one of the biggest, perhaps, jails a person can believe in is when they say, Oh, people, they never change. No, that's not true. A Jew knows that a person can genuinely change so much so that as we know about tshuva, as we've all learned at some point or another, that when we do tshuva, it can be as if our deliberate sins become as if they're accidental, and our accidental sins or missteps become as if they are mitzvot, as if they're good deeds. That is the power of change and the power of teshuva, all of which, all of which function within time. So the young Tovin, the Mikra Kodesh, what is, a, 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 what is the Mikra Kodesh? The proclamation of holiness. What is holiness? Holiness is the absence of anything that's going to block that connection to Hashem. And we have every day, every moment is an opportunity for that. It's true. But in Esrat Son, a special time of divine will and favor occurs on the holidays. And it also occurs every week on Shabbat, every single week. The possibilities are limitless. We don't realize it sometimes. We get into the Shabbat habit of, okay, maybe you have a nice nap. I know I do. Okay, you do an extra reading. You, you, yeah, you have more time to daven and say psalms and so on. But, but what are we doing with that time? We, we can apply our intention our focus, because our thoughts, as Rabbi Zal says, literally create a reality. We could go into Shabbat. This is the Shabbat of the ultimate healing of Teshuvah. Every week we can go into it when we, when we um, light candles. Okay. And remember, lighting candles is the beginning too. So everything proceeds from the beginning, as Rabbi Nachman says. Okay. So um, let's see. Or something okay so okay so this is also important here and i would like to um uh, follow up with more about this with reb nussen and reb nachman reb nussen says that the sanctification of the yom tovin of the ho of the holidays depends on who on the sages right? The best in. They're the ones who are going to set the calendar. So therefore, this is interesting, says, says uh, Reb, Reb Nussin and, or Reb Nussin via extension of Rebbe Nachman, therefore, the sages of the generation, even if they err in their calculation, even if they're wrong, 
even if they didn't declare Rosh Chodesh correctly, it doesn't matter. That's the day it becomes. They determine it, even if they're not right, even if they're not sure about the moon and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. Once they say it, once they proclaim it, that's what it is. So who are the sages? The sages were the tzaddikim and are the tzaddikim. And so therefore, from this, says Rick Nelson, this is he, how we learn the importance of having faith in the tzaddikim. So Hashem, who even obviously would know a real date, he would definitely know he knows everything. He would know that the sages may be erred. He would still accept, so to speak, the date that the sages slash tzaddikim said. Even Hashem is ruled by the tzaddikim, so to speak. This shows us the importance of having faith in our tzaddikim. Extremely important. I can't overstate it. When we have faith in the tzaddikim, faith implies, and Muna implies, that we listen to what they say. We don't just read it and have a nice intellectual experience. We let it move down into our hearts and we actualize it and we follow their advice. When we do this, when we do this, it is as if we are following the advice of Hashem himself, so to speak, because Hashem abides by the rulings of the tzaddikim in, in some circumstances. So it's really very powerful, this concept of the importance of the tzaddikim. Earlier in the beginning, we spoke about the kohanim and how we have to treat them with honor and respect. So with the tzaddikim, it's a little different. Sure, we have to have respect for them and honor for them, but what we also have to have for them is an appreciation for how much, how much they guide us. We should love the Kohanim because the Kohanim are all chesed. Kohanim are, are filled with chesed, okay? That's what our sages say. But the tzaddikim are also filled with chesed, with love for the Jewish people and love for Hashem. And their whole, their whole, uh, emphasis or whole energy is about making that connection, healing that breach between us and Hashem. It's really actually very simple. Of course, it takes many flavors and, and colors and paths, okay? Every, every tzaddik has a different path, uh, but, but they're all about bringing us closer to Hashem. How can we not listen to that? I mean, when I think of all the times, I mean, I, I try to follow Rebbe Nachman's advice. I try to follow the advice of many of the tzaddikim. When I think about the times where my Yitzhahara kicks in, I was like, I'm just not now. I'm just not going to follow it now. I think, how can I do that? Okay, how, when I'm feeling clear-headed, I'm like, how could I not listen? He says to do this. He says to believe this. He says to function like this. He says to treat other people like this. Why wouldn't I listen to me as messenger? What can I tell you? We all have a Yitzhahara. Okay, we'll continue. Um, let me see. I have more. Okay, so before I go to the Omer, um, Tab 1 and Tab 1. Before I go to the R, which is the count, I just want to briefly, briefly tell you about the festivals that are listed in the Parsha. Um, so back to my first page. So we have Shabbat. We start with Shabbat. Then we start with Pesach, which is a new year, as we all know. It's one of the four new years. Then we go to counting the Omer the 49 days between Pesach and Shavuos, Shavuot, which will be the 50th day. Then we have Rosh Hashanah, then Yom Kippur, then Sukkot, then Shemini Atzeret. Okay. So those are the festivals that are essentially covered in this Parsha, again, beginning with Shabbat. Um, so, 
see, what did I do? I switched up my page. Okay, so one of the, the points that I really want to focus on today is the Omer and the Omer process, because we are in the middle of Sferasa Omer, counting the Omer. What is counting the Omer? So first of all, what we have to understand is that the Omer in this Parsha is a, an instruction to the priests to do a special Omer offering, okay, that is waved in the air, okay, on the second day of Pesach. Now, I'm going to actually get you a description of this. What is the Omer? The Omer is a dry measure, okay, so the Omer is a measurement, and it is containing the volume of 43.2 average size eggs. It approximately turns out to be five pounds, the offering, okay? But we specifically, it goes by volume, not weight, weight. And it's the amount of flour that must be brought and is also used as the name of the offering. Just like challah, okay, we say challah, we refer to a nice braided bread, but really challah is the portion that we take to give to the Kohen, okay? But the name has taken the bread of challah. Okay, so the omer is the measurement, but the, the offering is given the name of the measurement. And it's specifically barley flour, and barley flour is considered animal food. Now, the omer process is as follows. After the barley was harvested, it would be taken to the azara, which is the, the, the courtyard of the Beit HaMikdash, and it would be threshed which is like beaten so that the husks fly off. The kernels would be roasted, okay? They would be ground, and then they would be sifted 13 times. And it would take approximately 40 pounds of barley in order to obtain one omer of the pure sifted flour, okay? That, that one omer is, again, is about five pounds, but it's really done by volume. And on the 16th of Nisan in the daytime, the Kohen would mix the Omer with oil and incense, like a minka offering. And he would do this process called tanufa, which is waving it in the air. It's a special waving ceremony. We'll talk about that. And he would wave it in all four directions as well as up and down. Now, what is important? What does the why the second day of Pesach? So in the very most material sense, in the Peshat, we are forbidden, or we were forbidden, it depends where you live, from eating the new grain until the, the new harvest, the newly, newly planted new harvest grain until the Omer offering was made. Okay, so this law still applies in the land of Israel. In Chutzlar, it's in, in, in other places, it applies, some communities say it applies, some, many communities are very lenient about this. So what is this? So this is the laws of Yashan and Chadash. Yashan means the old crop, and Chadash, of course, means new. And the requirement is uh, alluded to in this Parsha, the Torah commands that upon our arrival in the land of Israel, we are to bring a special bundled Omer on the second day of Pesach, okay? And until this offering is brought, the Chadash, the new crop, uh, and it can be any of the five grains until this, it, it, the new crop that we can't touch, wheat, barley, oats, spelt, and rye, although the Omer was barley, may not be consumed. Only once the Korban Omer is sacrificed or in its absence, the day of the Korban has passed, the new crop is now no longer considered new. And it, it's considered yashan now and it's per, permissible to consume. Okay. So this law is something that must be adhered to today in Israel. Again, outside, it really depends on the community. 
So the laws of Hadash, um, historically, European Jewry didn't necessarily hold by it. Some communities did, some didn't. Um, the Vilna Gon was um, held by it, but the Hasidim mostly did not. And the, the reason is, and there's a few reasons, but I'll just give you in general, it was very hard. It was very difficult in, in that time to know if the grain was new or not. You would buy grain after Pesach. Was that harvest from the previous year's harvest or was it this year's harvest? It wasn't always possible to tell with the flour or the grain, but also food was scarce. And the rabbis didn't want people to starve. So they were lenient with this. Also, there's a question really whether it absolutely must be held in the land outside of Israel, because we know there are many, many laws that we keep in Israel, many halachas we keep in Israel that we don't keep here. Okay. So that's my doorbell. <laughs> it's my noisy doorbell. Okay. So anyway, it, it's, it's quite interesting because you, today, if you go to, you buy anything kosher, and a, a baked good, um, cookies, bread, whatever, you will see signs up that say whether it is yashan or hadash, whether it's the, the old the, from the previous harvest or hadash. And even if you buy packaged foods, you'll see this. And some bakeries have it as well. Okay. In Israel, it's, it's um, because it's a requirement, it is essentially, essentially listed, you know, the stores that have the hexer that you can hold by this. Okay. So anyway, um, that's something that I wanted to cover. And, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to cover it is because somebody actually asked me about this recently, whether she was required to keep this if she moved to Israel and the answer is yes. Okay, if you're, if you're keeping kosher, you keep these laws. Okay, um, next, let's talk about the Omer and how it was waived. So let me just get my, here. So the waving ceremony was as follows. It, it, he the the Cohen would wave it on the 16th of Nissan. He would wave the pan that it was in. Okay, it was a special kli, a special pan that it was in. It's called a service pan, containing the offering first in the, all directions, four directions, and then up and down. And by doing this, the Cohen was cementing. Okay, he was making a silent proclamation, if you will, a movement proclamation, if you will, that we accept the authority of the Rabbona Sha'alam, the creator and master of the universe. And by wavering it back and forth, forth, we asserting that the whole world is his, northwest, east, and south, which I do them in order, I don't know. And by waving it up and down, we're saying that he's the master over the upper and the lower spheres. This is cementing. This is reminding us of it. And it's also occurring spiritual, uh, 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 leading to spiritual shifts as well. Now, there is a reward for waving the Omer in all directions. Hashem will protect the harvest from evil winds that could come from the all the four directions. It's kind of interesting because we know in the Middle East, that there's a hot wind that can come and disrupt uh, uh, disrupt crops, and so on. Okay, so this is a a, a blessing that we get for the Omer. Okay, another is when we wave it up and down. The Midrash tells us that we are protected from harmful dew. What's harmful dew? I guess it would be an overabundance of dew, an overabundance of tall. We need just the right amount of tall. Okay. And then Hashem protects our crops from winds and dew. And, and therefore, they were very particular about this in the times of the Beit HaMikdash. 
So the Cohen would take this handful of dough and assault it and burn it on the Mizbeach after the waving. And the remainder was eaten by the Kohanim while they were inside the Azara. And we know that most of the offerings were eaten. Okay. So this offering protected us throughout history, this little Omer offering. And it just contained barley flour, which is considered animal food. This is not a valuable flour. Okay. If we look at the world, who eats barley flour? So in Tibet, okay, they eat barley flour. Why? They eat, they eat barley flour mixed with water, drinks made out of barley flour, cakes made out of barley flour, pancakes, whatever. The reason is, is barley grows. It's coarse. It can grow anywhere, really, and under not great conditions. It's considered a coarse and unrefined food, and it used to be a food for the crops. I happen to like barley but it was a food, excuse me, for the animals. Okay, so still we have a midrash that explains to us the value of the, the seemingly smallest mitzvah we have. Certainly waiting the Omer wasn't like this big grand mitzvah, okay? So there, there's a list in the Midrash of many reasons how the mitzvah of Omer saved us. And the sages want us to appreciate the value of every mitzvah. And I want to tell you about a really beautiful story about Purim and Haman and the Omer. So when King Ahasuerus ordered Haman to take his, uh, his cloak and his horse and dress Mordechai and lead him through the streets. While this was going on, Mordechai was sitting in the base midrash. He was sitting in, in, in learning with his students. And because it was the 16th of Nisan, the day on which the Omer was offered, right? Because it was the second day of Pesach, he was learning, he was teaching them the laws of the Omer, okay? So he was learning the Omer on that day. And that's what we do. Then whenever we learn, we try to keep it in line with the time. Sometimes not always, but we do. So all of a sudden, Haman approached and Mordecai said, oh no, he's going to come and try to kill me. And so he told his students, you should run away because he might kill you too. And they said, no, we're going to stay with him. Mordecai was a very great rabbi. Okay, and they wanted to stay with him. And they began to pray. Mordechai began to pray. And Haman walked in with his horrible, gruff, repulsive self. He walked into the base midrash and he saw the students and he said, I want to know what you're learning here. What are you up to? And the students said, well, we, we discussed the subject of the Omer, an offering which used to be brought to Hashem on the, this day, the 16th of Nisan, in the Holy Temple in J Jerusalem. And Haman was like, you brought an offering to God? What was it? Was it thousands of dollars, thousands of gold coins or thousands of silver coins? What was it? And they said, no, it was just a handful of, you know, a few pounds of barley flour. And it was worth 10 mana, which isn't much money at all. And Haman said, what? That's crazy. He said, that's what you Jews are up to? He said, you don't even... You don't even offer something grand to the king. You beat me to my offer of 10,000 kikar of silver that he was going to give the king for, for the deaths of all the Jews, God forbid. And therefore, and therefore, from there, Mordecai was placed on his horse, dressed in his robe, held Haman's scepter, paraded through the town. And Haman couldn't wrap his head around the fact that he was subjugated by this, these people who were studying the laws of the Omer, sitting, studying with great, great a focus and attention and love for the Torah, the laws of a few handfuls of barley flour. Why is the Omer so, we, we don't really understand it. It's from Hashem. That's why it's important. It's a mitzvah from Hashem. And we're taught by the sages that we really don't know the value of a mitzvah. We don't know 
we don't know whether the Omer offering or honoring our parents or giving tzedakah or making a blessing on something or not wearing shotness, a mixture of linen. And we really don't know which is more important, which is more valuable. We, we really have no way of ascertaining it. Now, sages discuss reasons for things and the importance of the mitzvahs, but at the baseline, we don't know. So what are we busy with the mitzvahs and learning about the mitzvahs and trying to include them in our lives to the best of our ability, to wherever we're holding? So the answer is because they're from Hashem. Hashem gave us these paths, these bonding tools in order to connect to him. Okay. So we're going to talk about counting the Omer shortly. I have a little bit more time. Um, okay, there's more, there's more, there's more. I don't know that I'm going to get to it. I wanted to talk about the connection between the Omer and Man. Um, I think we're going to talk about counting the Omer. So during this time, we are now in the period of Spheris HaOmer. And what we're doing here is we are counting from the first, second day of Pesach, okay, like the Omer, 49 days till Shavuos and Shavuot is the 50th day, okay? And many of you know, many of you do count, not all women count, it depends on the community, and some women count but without a blessing, it depends on the community, it depends what you hold by. But many of you know that we use this time as a period of introspection and a period of self-reflection and a period of personal growth. Now, next week, God willing, Tuesday night on May 17th at 8 p.m. New York time, I will be doing a discussion, an event class on Ladba Omer and Sviras Omer, the count of the Omer. And I will go into some detail about the different Svirot and their meaning and how we can make sense of them. Suffice it to say that there are many viewpoints. So one of the things that we're doing is we're counting is Rebbe Nachman reminds us is that we are counting in the present, okay? And I'm paraphrasing the importance of making every moment count and every day count. Nothing holds your attention like knowing what day it is and knowing what your mission is that day, okay? Which is why we love calendars. And what comes to my mind always when I, when I think about this I don't feel like I'm in prison, but, but this is what the image that comes to mind is that the old, uh, old cartoon or the old illustration of someone sitting in prison, God forbid, and doing the little, what day is it? They're doing the little cross hatches, you know, the tic-tac-toe, which is really just the way of counting it, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. They're counting off the days. Why are they counting off the days? Why do we need to know what day this is? Jews, we have to know. Because as Jews, Hashem gives us unique ability to have special votas, special ways of connecting with Hashem, special ways of, of, of following Hashem each day and each moment in time is different for us. Okay, so we have to be aware of the days. Now, the other thing is, as Rabbi Nachman tells us, as I mentioned earlier, each day brings a whole new beginning for us. So when we count, each day, of course, the day begins at sundown. So as you know, we count, we start counting the number each night. Each day gives us a new, fresh start. As just as every moment does, but there is something significant about the day. And there are two times of the day that give us the most fresh starts are the evening, Okay, when the day actually shifts into the next day, the turn, evening turns to night, and then there's that shift. Once the night, the three stars, depending on what time you hold by, there's a later time, an earlier time, that becomes a new fresh start. And then, of course, in the morning, right before dawn, is a new fresh start. Chatzos, also midnight, halachic midnight's also another start. So each time that we punctuate a shift, a time shift, an energy shift with a count, we are marking it and 
we are also doing our own level of proclaiming. Remember how I spoke about the tzaddikim and the sages before declaring this is Rosh Chodesh? Even if they erred, Hashem would honor their proclamation and say, nope, that they said it, that's what it is. We have a little sliver of that ability by beginning a count, okay? We have a sliver of that ability. And that ability is to say, today is a new day. Today, I am starting fresh. Today, I have the ability and God willing, the ratzon, the desire and the will to connect to whatever the energy of today is. Now, um, I want to get my notes. So I'm going to go off. I'm going to miss something important. <laughs> okay, I lost my page. Okay, so why the Omer begins with animal food? as I mentioned, slowly green. Why do we begin this counting? And why are we counting? Why are we even calling it the Omer? So Reb Nassim explains that the days of counting the Omer are very propitious, as I mentioned, for Teshuva, for coming closer to Hashem, for returning to Hashem, returning different aspects of ourselves. The parts of us that are blocked in a connection to Hashem are compared to an animal energy. And when we, we all do, when we descend, when we step back, when we're not informed what a true human energy is, okay, we are connected with this sort of animal energy. And when a person, Reb Nassim says, accepts this, accepts this animal energy, not to embrace it, but accepts the idea of remaining dumb, mute, not stupid, dumb, mute, like an animal, and doesn't talk back because after all, this is what differentiates, it, differentiates us from the animals as we speak, a human, Midaber is a speaker, okay? And when we are able, to remain silent in the face of a lot of difficulties, whether it's someone, God forbid, insults us or whether, God forbid, we're, we're suffering when we're able to remember that there's a part of us that hasn't been fully humanized yet, okay? When we do this, we are able to jump to that level of the human. This idea of the Omer is the idea of transformation from an animal energy, an animal, so the animal parts of us, okay, into a refinement process that occurs through counting, yes, but also occurs through silence, okay, through acceptance. We have to do both. And when we do this, Reb Nassim says that the teshuva that we do, this return to Hashem that we do, gives us a mouth. It gives us the ability to speak, and therefore we're going to even infuse our counting with more power and our speaking with more power. So we are reminded of so much during this counting the Omer process, taking those parts of us, what are the animal parts? Parts with desires that maybe aren't the desires that we need to be embracing, the parts of us that have a lot of anger, okay, parts of us that lash out at other people or ourselves, because we can beat ourselves up too, by silencing ourselves in the face of this kind of assault, by silencing our hearts too, as Rabbi Nachman says, to be dumb and stoke, to be quiet, both in the mouth and the heart, Okay, to not let the difficulties, to accept that this is a cleansing process, our animal soul needs to be, needs to be waved around, okay? Whatever this is, we are able to gain a new ability to speak. What is speech? A very human endeavor. 
So this is part of what's going on right now if we pay attention to it. Now, Rebbe Nachman also says that if we pay attention to anything going on, any world events, a conversation we have with a neighbor, a conversation we happen to hear between people, something we read, if we pay attention to whatever is going on each day during the Omer, we are going to find out that whatever is going on corresponds to and is expressed by or is an expression of that day of the Omer. Now, I won't give a count in case you haven't counted today yet, but I will tell you that we are in the week of Netzach. Okay. Netzach is both is two concepts. It's a concept of the eternal and it's a concept of victory. And the way we see them in a simple Breslau format is to understand, as Reb Nassim points out, that the idea of victory and the idea, idea of the eternal are, they're enmeshed. They're really two aspects of the same concept because in order for victory to have any value, it has to be eternal because, you know, when you have a victory, you have a fight with someone, you win, and then what? Okay, then it's over. Or as Reb Nassim more eloquently describes it, kings, okay, they, they go to war, they win land, they expand their empires, and then what happens? They die, their empires crumble, the lands, the map shifts. We always see map shifting. Everybody's a little shocked when they see a map shifting. This is the nature of the world. The map's the only map that doesn't shift is Israel, because that map of what Israel is, is permanent from Hashem. I mean, today, it, we don't have the map that the state of Israel has isn't the map of Israel, per se. But that's the only map that's permanent. Everything else is always shifting as governments and kings and rulers and tyrants and despots and even nice guys take over. Okay? Everything changes. It's always changing. Only Israel remains there. But Reb Nussin, explains that in order for victory to be victory, it has to be eternal. And in order to really be a winner, you have to align yourself with the eternal, which is of course Hashem, because only Hashem is eternal. He gives us, he does give us an etern eternal soul, but only anything aligned with Hashem is eternal, which is why you look at Italy. Italy, not, not very long ago, was a bunch of independent, fiefdoms, independent countries, okay? Now they're one, okay? You see what's going on in Ukraine. Ukraine was always at the center of Austria-Hungary. It was Poland. It was Russia. It was occupied here. It was occupied there. You see it going on today, okay? Doesn't mean we have to be happy about it, but it's the reality, okay? So also, this counting, reminds us, this counting reminds us this week of this idea of focusing on what's important. What's important is the stuff that's going to last. Okay, now, when we talk about counting the Omer, we're going we're gonna to go in a moment, but when we talk about counting the Omer, what we have to also remember is that we are um, we are working on various aspects of ourselves. There are many ways to view the spirit. In Breslau, the simpler way is to really view them, it's not just Breslau, but in Hasidus, many Hasidus in general, is to view them as aspects of ourselves that we can work on. It's not the only thing they are, okay? It's a very good tool for us to come closer to Hashem. And you might hear people say, well, that's not really what they are. They really have to be like this, or we don't agree with that interpretation. The truth is, is that if you're working on yourself and it aligns with the eternal, it's good. It's good. If it aligns with the eternal, it's aligning with emet, with truth, and it's good. So whatever it is, we should all keep counting. And... I want to wish you all a great week. Um, tomorrow, we will have Psalms for Life. I, actually, let me pause or stop the recording now. Um,